Good afternoon. I see the Zoom room is filling up. I want to welcome everybody into today's virtual speaker session. We have a great program lined up for you today. We are visiting with Dr. Barbara Rolls. She is going to share her insight on an emerging topic uh, over the last few years. She's going to be talking about volumetrics. So we are glad to see so many people zooming in with us. As usual, let us know who you are and where you're zooming in from today. Drop that information in the chat. If you have a question uh, for today's presenter, you can put those in the Q&A. We have some pre-submitted questions already. Uh, thank you for those of you that have submitted those questions. We will try to get to as many of those as we possibly can. We'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. We wanna let the Zoom room fill up, but I see uh, Folks from all over again, Doug and Lori up in Massachusetts. I see Allison in Teaneck, New Jersey, Beth Seifert, uh, Jenny Rothweiler down in Lancaster, Rob and Linda out in Pittsburgh. Silverthorne, Colorado is represented. Katie, good to see you. And Marion Rogers in Liverpool, New York. Rebecca in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Laura Brown here in State College. Denise in Newcastle, Delaware, alumni and friends from all over the place. I see Todd Walk out there in Bend, Oregon, beautiful part of our country. Whitney uh, Martin tuning in as usual from the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia, Michael down in Princeton, New Jersey, Kathy and Hershey. A great crowd today for our virtual speaker session. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Thanks for joining us. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom video window, and then clicking show subtitle. You may also customize your caption view by clicking the stream to text link posted in the chat. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, that information is also in the comments on Facebook Live. We are streaming today's presentation and this live stream has been made possible through the gracious support of a donor and the Fund for Access Ideas and Audacious Goals. Today's presentation will be archived and available on our website after the event. This afternoon, we welcome Dr. Barbara J. Rolls who will share insight on an emerging topic over the last few years, volumetrics. Volumetrics is a healthy eating plan for weight management based on research conducted here at Penn State. In this presentation, Dr. Rolls, who is the professor and Helen A. Guthrie Chair of Nutritional Sciences, will discuss how the density of calories in the foods you eat affects hunger and satisfaction. She will present simple, proven strategies to choose foods that will help you to think positively about what you can eat while managing calories rather than focusing on restriction or deprivation. Dr. Rolls received her PhD in physiology from the University of Cambridge in England. After spending her early research career at the University of Oxford, Dr. Rolls became professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. In 1992, she joined the Pennsylvania State University faculty, where she is the professor and Helen A. Guthrie Chair of Nutritional Sciences. Her studies have demonstrated how characteristics of food such as variety, energy density, and portion size can influence energy intake and body weight. Dr. Rolls has served as president of both the Society for the Study of Ingestive Behavior and the Obesity Society. Welcome, Dr. Rolls, to today's virtual speaker session. I will turn it over to you. Thanks a lot, Paul, for the introduction. I'm really pleased to be with you now. This has been a, a rough year, and I know some of us have uh, been uh, surrounded by food and perhaps eating a bit more than we should. And 
one surprising thing that you may not know is I think a lot of people think that we start worrying about our weight um, around the new year when we make resolutions. Actually, the springtime is when we really get serious about it. So today I'm just going to, with a few slides, give you a very simple overview of uh, some of the principles of volumetrics and a few tips that we've learned from our research here at Penn State. Um, and I have to say Penn State has been amazingly supportive and I don't think that we would have accomplished what we have with understanding um, diet and healthy eating without the support um, of our great institution. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Let's uh, get the slides up. Okay. So yeah, the research that I'm talking about <clears throat> is supported by um, NIH and the Department of Agriculture. And uh, all right, so what is the optimal diet for weight management? You can see down at the bottom, I found some of the things that people have fantasized about being the best diets in the past, <laughs> domino sugar, pineapples, ice cream. Um, we're all confused. Um, and most of the programs that we hear about and that get a, a lot of attention are based on uh, fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And if we somehow change the proportions of those macronutrients in our diets, that we will miraculously shed weight without worrying about uh, much else and not really having to move a lot. And that really is not the way we're thinking now in nutrition and in um, the weight management world. Really, the focus has shifted to eating a healthy diet with a balance of nutrients. So it's the overall eating pattern that you follow. And this is what the um, US uh, dietary guidelines advocate, a healthy eating pattern. So how do we achieve that? Well, to manage your weight, it's still about calories. And I, we can't uh, reinvent the laws of thermodynamics. Um, if you wanna lose weight, you have to expend more energy uh, than you're taking in. Um, and we used to just think it was pretty simple that there were uh, 3,500 calories in a pound and you decrease your intake by about 500 calories a day over a week, you would lose a pound. Um, it's, not, it's not that easy. Our metabolisms vary and they vary as we lose weight. So um, I've given you the link to a weight planner uh, guide that has been developed uh, through the National Institutes of Health, which will give you specific advice based on your weight height, um, your goals for um, weight management on how much you should be eating um, your, your daily calorie intake. So I would recommend playing with that. It's, it's quite fun. So since it's about calories, I want to tell you about calorie density. That's the number of calories in each bite that you eat. Um, the number of calories you pack into a bite can have a big impact on how much you eat. So we're back to the macronutrients again. Um, fat has the most calories in a bite or per gram. These are all representing one gram of food. Alcohol, unfortunately, also packs a lot of calories um, into each gram. Carbohydrate and protein are about half of the uh, um, calorie density of, of fat with four calories per gram. Fiber, um, which we all should be eating more of, is lower in calorie density. But here, here we have what has been relatively new in understanding food intake and diets. Water um, packs no calories in uh, a gram. And actually, when you look at the most commonly consumed foods that we eat, water is the biggest component of many of them. 
All right, so how can we reduce the energy density or calorie density? They're, they're the same thing. I, I talk about calorie density now because um, I find people understand it better than talking about energy density. All right, so to reduce the uh, calorie density, reducing your fat intake can have a large effect. I don't wanna recommend just a, a low fat uh, diet though, because fat gives uh, taste uh, to foods. It carries a lot of the flavors. And actually uh, fat, which has been vilified in the past is, is not uh, considered that bad. We can eat up to 30% uh, of our calories from fat, but you need to focus on healthy fats. Um, and those are um, you know, avoiding some of the animal fats as much as you can. Use fat judiciously to um, enhance the flavor, but don't overdo it. Uh, so where you can reduce it, go ahead. Sugar reduction can also help, um, but we don't, I mean, sugar compared to uh, fat isn't gonna have as big an impact. We don't eat that much of it, hopefully. Incorporating more water into your diet is where you have the biggest opportunity to decrease the calorie density of the foods you eat. And if we just look, um, this example of the raisins versus the grapes is one that I think resonates well with people. If you look at what 110 calories of raisins versus grapes looks like, so you get a quarter of a cup of raisins for one and three quarters cup so grapes. Same food, just one is hydrated, the other not. And if you look at where the water is in uh, commonly consumed foods, it's it's pretty much everywhere except dry snacks, those sorts of things. Um, don't have the water to help reduce the density of calories. So I want to just give you um, some practical tips that have resulted from some of our studies, and then we can move on to the Q&A. So one strategy that we found can be really effective is this, what I like to call filling up first, having an extra course and ending up eating less. And this comes with uh, judiciously choosing what you have for a first course before you get to the main course. Um, and we'll start with soup. Soup is probably the most studied individual food in terms of weight management. There've been a number of uh, clinical trials that uh, have shown that adding uh, soup to your diet or substituting soup for other foods can help to control hunger. And um, we did a clinical trial comparing uh, people eating um, 100 calorie portions of soup versus things like pretzels or crackers. And the people that were eating the soup lost significantly more weight over a year. Um, what kind of soup there was a question that I got, can you use, um, canned soup, prepared soups, sure. But you're, you're best off um, if you're doing a first course to use a broth-based soup, one that doesn't have um, a lot of calories. Aim for 100 to 150 calories. And you know if it's bulked out with lots of vegetables and some uh, beans for fiber, some lean protein, that's great. If it's a main course, then you can go up to three or 400 calories. And again, um, if you can use broth-based, um, even better. So um, I wanted to tell you about this study in this mysterious picture. We did a study um, some years back where as a first course, we gave people either no first course, or this is a chicken rice vegetable casserole. Um, the people came in on four different days. So one day they get this as the first course. Another day, they got the same casserole with a 10 ounce glass of water. Another day, they got these two ingredients cooked up together to make a big cup of soup. And we found that um, if, you, if you added on this kind of first course, uh, you end up eating um, more food over the whole meal. But if you have a big cup of soup at the start of the meal, people actually ate several hundred calories less total at the meal. So they got a, an extra course of soup and ended up eating less food at the meal. So um, it's a really effective way to fill up first. 
Um, one, one thing that this also tells us, I think a lot of people think that drinking water um, is a great diet strategy. And we didn't find these two, these two conditions had the same effect on how much was eaten, eaten at the next course. Just drinking the water along with the casserole did not have any extra benefit. Um, water, when you drink it and it's not incorporated into food, empties out of your stomach very rapidly. Another thing about drinking water is it satisfies thirst mechanisms, which are completely different from hunger mechanisms in your body. So you really need to eat your water to have it help you fill up and feel full. Okay, well, and this is another strategy that I'm sure you would have thought would make sense, eat a big salad at the meal. So again, you can do this as a, a first course. In, in this study, uh, we compared uh, three different salads, um, the same size, but with different um, toppings and calorie levels. So this one has a, a low calorie dressing, it doesn't have cheese, et cetera. And then we go up from 100 calories to 200 to a 400 calorie uh, first course. Um, this one didn't work so well. If they had that first, they ended up at the whole meal eating an extra 145 calories. The 200 calorie one, they ate about the same, whether they had the salad or not. When they had the big low calorie salad, they actually at the total meal um, ate about 100 calories less. So go for it, have a big salad at the start of the meal, but make sure it, um, doesn't have too many calories. So watch your toppings and your dressing. But you do want some, some oil, some fat um, with your salad because the fat carries the fat soluble vitamins. You're gonna get more nutritional benefit um, if you have some fat in the salad. Okay, another strategy, having a first course of fruit. Um, in, in this study, we gave either um, one and a half apples sliced up or applesauce, the same amount, or apple juice. And we had apple juice with fiber added to it or um, without. Most of the juice you buy in the grocery store has virtually no, no fiber in it. Um, so what we found here was that if people had um, the applesauce first, they pretty much ate about the same calories with the two courses. Um, the juice uh, added a few calories. With the whole um, apple sliced up, people ate about 20% less, um, almost 200 calories less at the total meal. So again, they filled up first, so they didn't want as much of the um, higher calorie density next course. Of course, most of our, our food when uh, we're eating comes from our main course. So there are lots of ways that you can reduce the calorie density of your main course. And this just this picture gives you a dramatic example, your um, pasta Alfredo versus a uh, pasta primavera for the same number of calories. Uh, look how much more food you can get if you um, reduce the fat and bulk up your um, recipes with uh, lots of uh, nutritious um, vegetables, your favorite vegetables, uh, fruits. Um, this looks better. You get a much bigger portion uh, for your calories if you go lower calorie density. Um, so what I would advocate for you is to learn to modify your favorite foods without sacrificing uh, taste. Okay, and this just, I think we all hear over and over again, just eat less, just um, cut your portions across the board. And I actually don't advocate that. There, we should be eating less of the higher calorie density foods, but we need to be eating more of the low calorie density foods. So this just gives you an example of how you can um, keep your plate full while you're cutting calories. So here's a, a typical meat and potatoes meal, um, 800 calories. If you just cut all the portions in half to get the 400 calories, you end up with a half empty plate. And, you know, we learn, we, by the time we're adults, we've eaten uh, thousands 
of meals. And we know how much food we need to fill us up. So you're gonna look at that middle plate and you're gonna say, that's not enough food. I know I'm gonna be hungry. Um, so you can, you can trick your brain, and we've shown this in many studies, by giving the same weight or volume of food, um, but of lower calorie density food. So here we have a 400 calorie full plate um, that uh, will help to fill you up. And when we do these kinds of studies, we don't find that people get hungrier later or compensate at the next meals. So we've done a number of clinical trials now and people around the world have that show that teaching people how to strategically vary the calorie density and manage portions so that they're um, eating bigger portions of the low calorie density foods and smaller of the high calorie density foods helps with weight loss and with weight loss maintenance. Uh, so just some tips about how we um, advise consumption of different kinds of foods. And I do want to say with volumetrics, we don't ban any foods. You, you can eat your favorite foods. Some foods you have to eat in more moderation than others if you're managing calories. So that's what these categories are about. So category one is your very low calorie density foods. And it um, makes sense. It's your, your broth-based soups, um, your uh, uh, sugar-free yogurts, most um, non-starchy vegetables. And here, these, these foods in this category are essentially free foods. You can eat um, really satisfying portions without uh, over-consuming calories. So the next category, and there are a lot of foods in this category, uh, includes your legumes, rice, potatoes, your starchy vegetables, um, some fruits, lean meats. This is a lean chicken breast. And here, you, you can still eat relatively large portions, but you're starting to have to get into uh, more portion control as the energy density gets higher. Um, category three, then um, you're getting into your dry snacks, your crackers, your pretzels that uh, don't have the water to dilute down the calories. Um, interestingly, cheese and pretzels have the same calorie density. Um, even though the uh, cheese is fattier, it has um, quite a bit of water in it. Your eggs, a lot of pasta dishes, breads. Here, you do have to manage uh, portion size more carefully. And then we get to the final category. I think we all know what this is. This is your chocolates, your, your um, pure fats, um, and your, your fatty or dry snacks. And here you can eat these foods, but you, you need to manage portions. I mean, foods like nuts um, have healthy fats. They have um, fiber. They are nutritious foods. So you can surely eat them, but they're, they're very Moorish and it's easy to take in a lot of calories from them. So you do have to watch your portions. Okay, so here's a kind of gee whiz uh, picture showing you for um, 1600 calories over a whole day, um, how managing the calorie density can affect how much you get to eat. So here we have a high calorie density diet. Um, most people's average calorie density is around 1.5 to 1.8. So this is really pretty extreme. But you know, for breakfast, you have a cinnamon bun. For lunch, you only get half a cheeseburger, a few fries, and some chips. Um, here's your pasta alfredo again. Really small portions, only 590 grams of food. You go down to really low calorie density, and this is extreme, and we're pushing the limits here. But you can see that here you get 2,300 grams of food, and you get a lot more food, big portions, and it looks so much better. It looks so much healthier. Um, so, and you know, it's it's got the nutrients that you need. One thing, I there was a question: Am I talking about um, calorie density or nutrient density? Calorie density is what we're illustrating here, but you want to emphasize 
high nutrient dense foods when you're eating. Those are ones that pack all the vitamins, minerals, et cetera, into the food you're eating. Okay, so just overall then, the tips, you wanna increase the variety and availability of lower calorie dense foods. Those are the ones you wanna keep on hand. So when you get the munchies, make sure you have your favorite fruits, veggies, um, soups, et cetera, um, easily at hand. You want to make sure that you have adequate intake of protein. And there's a pretty wide range that we can consume, anywhere from um, 10 to up to 35%. Uh, you do need to eat um, adequate protein. We, our bodies um, can't make the protein. We use the protein um, uh, to... I mean, we, we use, uh, we need to eat protein um, to keep our bodies uh, functional. Um, we don't store it the way we do the carbs and fat. Um, all right, well, we've heard a lot about high water foods. We also wanna emphasize um, high fiber foods. Both protein and fiber can help to contribute to satiety or that feeling of fullness that we get um, with eating. Um, Vegetables, fruits, soups, whole grains and legumes give you um, a good amount of fiber. And I think most of us are certainly not eating enough. And then you emphasize the portion control for calorie dense foods. And those are the ones with unhealthy foods or low moisture content. And I have written three books on this um, in order of when they came out. So the weight control plan was first, then the eating plan, and then the ultimate volumetrics diet. So ultimate to me meant the last one. Um, so just in, in case you're um, wondering, it doesn't mean it's the best diet ever. It means writing diet books is really hard. And I thought three was enough. So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I will take questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Rolls. A lot of questions coming in on this topic. Uh, a popular, popular subject indeed. We had questions pre-submitted and now some questions coming in um, all along the way here. Let's see, let's, let's start with, um, Let's start with kind of, um, Sally wants to know about um, the kind of, please speak on, on hunger and how volumetrics can help people trying to lose weight, feel satisfied or feel satiated, right? How do you kind of balance that, that hunger feeling that you sometimes feel when you're dieting and how does volumetrics help with that? Great question, and that's really kind of the crux of volumetrics. I study satiety, that feeling of fullness that you get um, when you've had enough food. And since I've been telling you that with the, the low calorie density foods, you, you get a lot more food, you get much more satisfying portions. That um, satisfies your learning about how much food you should eat. It also gives you more chewing, more oral, experience, um, more um, stomach distension, um, the fiber in foods helps to slow down your stomach emptying. So basically it's, it's helping you to feel full and to avoid hunger. And we find when we do studies where we reduce the calorie density of foods, we do a lot of studies where we, we um, covertly uh, change the calorie density of the foods we're offering people. We've even done this in three to five year old kids. And what people do if the foods taste similar, but you've bulked one out with lots of fruits and veggies, but maybe taken some fat out, is they, they tend to eat a very consistent weight or volume of foods. This is a strategy. People think we're, we're managing calories from meal to meal. What we're doing when we eat is we're looking and saying, oh, that looks like the right amount of food. That's how much I should eat. And they, you don't know what the density of calories is. So you eat, you eat an amount that looks like the right amount, even little kids. And when you do that, you reduce the calorie density. The foods taste just as good. Um, people automatically are then eating fewer calories because um, they're eating the same weight. It just packs fewer calories. They don't get hungrier, even in year long trials. 
we just did a study where we manipulated the calorie density of um, the preschool kids in our, our child care centers on, on campus before we closed down. We did a study where we did this over five days and the kids didn't compensate for reductions in calorie density over the five days. They didn't get hungrier. Um, but if you bump up the calorie density, they eat more. So, you know, it's, it, it's just, it's something very surprising about us that we, we can, we manage on, on a daily basis by really assessing how much food is the right amount to eat. So uh, big, um, anyone who watches TV hears and sees advertisements for Noom, uh, a lot of questions coming in about about that. Uh, Robin asks, I'm a registered dietitian and is interested by this concept of, of volume eating with fewer calories while I was using the Noom app for uh -huh. weight reduction. Would you say Noom or similar apps are acceptable methods to assist people in learning healthier eating habits? Yeah, I know it's funny people ask about Noom because um, they came to us when they were a startup and I couldn't help them at the time I was working with another company. So my lab manager, Jennifer Mings, actually went up to New York and developed the diet part of Noom along with them based on volumetrics. So oh, wow. I thought it was quite funny that they had worked that. Weight, Weight Watchers, a lot of what they do is based on calorie density too. And certainly Jenny Craig. I mean, this is really well accepted now that uh, you should be managing the density of calories. The great thing about it is it fits with any kind of diet program that you might want to uh, adapt. So if you want to do paleo or intermittent fasting or anything, you can still be watching the calorie density of the foods that you choose to include in that plan. But Noom, sure, there are a lot of apps out there. Pick one that uh, suits you. There's no one diet that's going to meet everybody's needs. You need to find one that you can do long term because sustaining this stuff is, is the problem. Learning how to eat healthily um, in a way you enjoy is the key to long-term success, but make sure that whatever you're doing is um, a healthy plan. Too much restriction when you're cutting calories, to cutting out too many foods is not a great idea. So um, at the end of the day, this is, it's, a math, it's a math equation, right? You need to burn more calories than you're eating during the day to lose, to lose weight, right? How do people know what that um, what that number is? Like, how do people know how much how many calories they're burning during the day, so that they know where to set that calorie limit on on their food intake? Sure. So I I gave you the link for that calorie tracker that NIH has. Of course, there are a lot of um, trackers that you can wear now, um, Fitbits, all kinds of um, devices. Um, I recommend that if people are starting uh, a program to for a week or two, try to get some sense of what you're eating, how many calories you're getting. I mean, people, um, you know, they think I'm advocating counting calories indefinitely. Not at all. I wouldn't be able to do it. I, I want you to figure out what you're doing so that you can figure out where you can tweak things. So for example, if you're drinking a whole lot of soda, that to me is always a good place to start because there's so many alternatives, um, things like that. Get, get an idea of what your calorie needs are. As I say, from that calorie tracker, it'll give you a good assessment. It'll tell you what you need to do to meet goals over whatever time period you want. But then the whole point about volumetrics is knowing where you can save calories. So, I mean, pretty much if you choose water rich foods and substitute them for foods that are drier or higher in fat, you're gonna be saving calories. So, and it all adds up over the day. So you tweak your favorite recipes a little bit. They still taste great. Don't, don't sacrifice things. Um, and uh, learn how to make those favorite foods, your, your, your usual eating plan, just a bit lower in overall calories by tweaking the density. You, you bring up soda. There's a couple questions coming in about soda. Um, what is the verdict on 
zero calorie drinks, which are sweetened with artificial sweeteners, diet soda, zero calorie lemonade. Some people say that the diet drinks actually make people gain weight. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on that? Or what does the research tell you about that? Yeah, um, so the research that looks like people might gain weight on diet soda are population-based studies where they find that people who drink diet soda are heavier. And that's probably they're drinking diet soda because they're heavier, not because the diet soda made them heavy, you know? Right. So it's, it's this, uh, you know, chicken or egg thing. Um, the um, safety of these things, you know, they've been scrutinized heavily by uh, the Food and Drug Association. I think um, there we have to go along with uh, their verdict. There really isn't clear evidence that they make you hungrier um, and indeed, there are a number of clinical trials that show if you use um, the sugar substitutes, it can help you to save calories, but you have to do it with a clear goal in mind. You, you, see, you go to a fast food restaurant, you see somebody ordering a diet soda along with a triple cheeseburger and double fries and hoping for some sort of magic erasing of the calories by ordering the diet soda. It doesn't work that way. I mean, obviously, you substitute um, a lower calorie drink or anything else for one that's higher calorie, um, it can help you at that time save calories. Now, where other arguments come in is later on, um, over weeks or months, you might your body might sense that you're eating fewer calories and start compensating. But we're talking right now, you wanna save calories at a meal, sure. Of course, I think water is the best option, so. <laughs> right, right. So a, a lot of questions coming in about different kinds of diets. We've heard about um, we've heard about intermittent fasting. Uh, someone's asking a question about what if I had two meals that were 12 hours apart? We've heard from some people that talk about, well, maybe it's not a three, maybe you shouldn't have three meals during the day. Maybe it's smaller portions throughout the day, if maybe five meals, if you will. Um, can you speak a little bit to some of those strategies? Oh uh, yeah, you, there are about a dozen questions all wrapped yeah, up. Yeah, sorry about that. It's, it's okay. No, I mean, I expected questions on uh, time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting because they're very trendy right now. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, research going on. NIH is pouring a lot of money into this. If you only eat over eight hours a day, there is some evidence that you can effectively lose weight. But in the number of trials, I just actually, we covered this in one of my classes on Friday and looked at all of the latest stuff. So it doesn't do better than just ordinary calorie restriction. Um, and also if you're gonna do the time restricted feeding, there is a study that shows you don't need to go lower than an eight hour um, eating window. You don't have to go down to six. You're not going to get any additional benefit. What I don't like about it is that they're saying that during those eight hours or whatever that you can eat, you can eat whatever you want. And that's not a good idea. No matter how many hours a day you're eating, you need to be eating a good healthy diet with a good balance of nutrients, your, your fruits, vegetables, whole grains, etc. cetera. Um, so for me, that advice doesn't change just because you're not eating over as many hours. Um, on all of these kinds of things, whether you eat three meals, two meals, or you eat multiple meals, and I talk about this in my latest book, you, you have to figure out what works for you. For some people, eating um, more frequently helps them to avoid extreme hunger. And of course, extreme hunger can lead to loss of control. Um, so that's fine. Um, you know, for other people, if they're eating frequently, they're going to be exposed to food more often and they're going to be more, have more opportunities to overeat. So again, the research on, on this multiple frequent meals or less frequent is six and one half a dozen another. And I think it really, so much of what we have to tell you about diet and what you're doing, you have to do what's going to work for you. Um, we're, we all have um, different things that we can achieve around diet. And um, 
you know, I can I can tell you this experiment, that experiment, but that right. may not be what's going to be optimal for you. So you find a you find an eating pattern that makes it easiest for you to avoid overeating. Well, I anticipated this question when you put it up <laughs> on your on your slides when when you uh, I don't want to say attacked alcohol, but uh, oh. <laughs> someone's wondering is, is having a small glass of wine, maybe five ounces each evening, a bad idea? Gosh, right now, I think it's a bad idea not to. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has been a, a tough year, and I I think that I mean the thing is it it has calories. You can work out what those is. You 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 those are. You can accommodate that. Um, I mean one issue is that when you've had your one glass of wine, your resolve to um, eat healthfully and, and to right. not eat some of the higher calories may dissolve along with the, the beverage. There's a lot of research on, on that. So, but often, you know, drinking the alcohol and its effects on weight have to do with what you eat along with it. Um, so often, you know, beer and, and dry snacks uh, go hand in hand. Um, eating high fat along with alcohol helps to deposit the alcohol in your body as fat. So, you know, but I think again, it's, it's what you can balance in, in your plan. And um, just some people, maybe can't give up chocolate other people they're going to have that glass of wine and i think that that's where the sustainable part what what can you what can you do long term um so many people lose weight and then then they haven't actually figured out how to live with whatever they were trying to do long term so i want people to get to the point where they can just enjoy eating and not be thinking right. about it all the time the healthy eating your glass of wine along here it's all just that's what you do and you you do it healthfully and and with enjoyment uh speaking of enjoying what you're eating bridget is not giving up her fettuccine alfredo okay um, so, so she has a question um and it might be admitting it might be a silly question i don't think it's silly at all but um can i put a bunch of grilled vegetables uh into the alfredo um and maybe a little bit less sauce and and pasta uh, would that help make it uh, more calorie friendly? Absolutely. She's got it. That's what you do. Um, you take your favorite recipe and you tweak it. And so you still you still like it. I mean, you can have your Alfredo, but you're only going to get a small portion for um, your calories that you um, should be eating. Um, it's a, it, it, then it becomes much easier to overeat it, too, because you're going to fill your plate to whatever level you usually would eat of pasta but sure she's got it you just uh figure out how to um tweak the sauce maybe you know herbs and spices other seasoning cuisine are great ways to help to make the your favorite foods lower in calorie density but still yummy absolutely judy and todd are asking a question in the same ballpark can you explain the relationship between volumetrics and low glycemic plans. Todd specifically <laughs> asking about um, about popcorn, which is somewhat high in GI, but but has volume. Um, so, can you uh -huh. talk about the relationship between those two? Yeah, um, often it's hard to separate them, and you know some of the GI people they they kind of consider we're in a diet war. I, I see a lot of overlap between them. The thing about glycemic index and most um, dietary advice, none of the dietary guidelines have ever bought into it. It's really hard to follow because um, the glycemic index of foods, it's only for carbohydrates and it varies depending on what you're eating with that food, um, even, even things like refrigerating foods can change it. So um, I, I think that calorie density is much easier to, to understand and it, it doesn't 
change between, I mean, the glycemic index is very variable between people. Um, if you have if you have diabetes, then you right. want to be aware of it. But um, if you're eating a volumetric diet, you're eating lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grains. So you're, you're eating mostly low GI foods anyway. Um, some people are interested in kind of the physiology of, of, of hunger. Um, they read about leptin and ghrelin, but how do we manage these hormones? And, and well, is managing those hormones a strategy? Um, they're going on in the background. And as you eat, they're going to change. And as you get hungry, they're going to they're gonna vary. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what I'm advocating is, is eating a high satiety diet. And that's going to be working through the mental, the oral, the gastric, and those hormones also, uh, we've looked at some of these hormones in relation to low caloric density um, diets. Um, you, you can, I mean, doing the kinds of things that I'm advocating are gonna help with the satiety, the hunger and satiety hormones. Um, we, we don't have, um, you know, apart from these behavioral strategies, you, you can't really do much else. We don't have um, a lot of drugs that are going to be suitable for all of you to be managing these things. But yeah, high fiber, um, lots of fruits and veggies, enough lean protein, um, the eating frequency that suits best to keep you um, from getting overly hungry or overly full. I mean, it's just... Um, we all, of course, can eat around these hormones. You know, our environment can induce us to um, eat regardless of our biology. And that's, that's where we are right now. Most of us are not paying enough attention to how hungry and full we feel. And I give some guidance on how to get in touch with that in, in my books, you know, uh, trying to figure out when you really are hungry, when you should eat and how full you, you should aim to get. Another uh, another question coming in here. Uh, interested in vegetarian menu suggestions. Um, uh, along those same lines, uh, Ed's adding, asking a question about um, how do you feel about protein supplements, um, powders, and bars. So th those folks who may not be getting protein uh, in in their diet from from meats, uh, if you will. Um, what are some kind of vegetarian options and how do you feel about supplements? Okay, so um, the ultimate value metrics does indicate which uh, recipes are vegetarian. Both of my daughters are vegetarian. Well, one's pescatarian and one's straight up vegetarian. Um, granddaughter, vegetarian. So I, I mean, we, we have a, we're a very mixed family in, in terms of... Um, carnivores. Um, I think I'm a chicketarian, so <laughs> you know, I eat a lot of chicken. Um, but uh, it's always best to uh, try to eat your nutrients rather than taking them as supplements if, if you can. Um, there, a lot of the research that's done on protein and satiety is done with supplements and separating out the different types of uh, protein. Um, and it's hard to know whether they're as relevant to um, eating real food as, as they should be. Because I think part of um, getting a good satiety boost from the protein that you eat is that we're conditioned to think of the protein center of the meal as part of what contributes to a meal's satisfaction. Um, so I think, um, sure, if you really think you're, you're short on protein, most of us, I mean, when you look around the world at the protein consumption of virtually any population that has enough food, they're eating about 15% of their calories as protein, pretty much as the, the baseline. And, uh, you know, that, that works pretty well for most of us. In, in America now, it's pretty hard to get protein deficient. Sure. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Um, Don wants to know if there are any vegetables that should be avoided when, when making soups or salads. You hear the word vegetable and, and you automatically triggers good, but are there ones that maybe we want to um, limit intake of? Well, anything, if you ate too much of it would be a problem, but since vegetables have so much water, it's really hard to overeat them. I mean, obviously we're thinking about the starchy vegetables, but, uh, and potatoes often have a, a bad rap, um, but potatoes are, they're low in calorie density. It depends on what you do with them. If you're gonna fry them, then probably, yeah, <laughs> we can make potato chips out of them. Uh, or add um, a couple of buckets worth of sour cream and butter. But on the whole, um, yeah, I mean, potatoes, for example, make a really good cream base to a soup. And you're not, I mean, you're adding a lot of water. So I say most of us are eating only a fraction of the vegetables that we should be eating. Obviously making up that difference shouldn't just be from things like potatoes, but no, I mean, go for it. We're, uh, we're, we really have so many culinary opportunities now with vegetables. And I think a lot of chefs are beginning to realize that. I think what makes me maddest about the vegetables is you go out to a family style restaurant, you get a nice portion of vegetables and they've dumped some kind of weird oil on it. So it's swimming around in something that doesn't to me enhance the taste and is just driving up the calorie density unnecessarily. I think when I was when I was growing up, we had the salt shaker on the table and we had the butter or margarine on the table and you did it yourself. And now chefs right. feel they have to add it for you. And that isn't always what you want. So you can order, especially in restaurants, I would say you can ask for um, stuff to be eliminated if that's your pleasure. So there is a, as you might imagine, a high volume of questions coming in on uh, volume metrics. We're not going to be able to get to all of them today. Um, but some people are asking, you know, who do you go, what blogs do you go to and who do you read to stay up to date on this topic? Oh, I'm, I'm not somebody who reads a lot of blogs, I have to say. I'm pretty old school. I I read the scientific literature. I get a whole lot of, um, uh, you know, newsletters. And I read things like Nutrition Action, Nutrition Today. And of course I, I read the nutrition stuff in um, the Washington Post and the New York Times, those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm, I'm old school compared to <laughs> some of you. I, I, I go for more traditional, sources and um we actually in in my classes um several of them we always cover what's in the news so um the students are looking for interesting um stuff related to obesity or to eating behavior so they of course the students always keep you smart right absolutely, uh, absolutely. <laughs> but don't trust everything that you get the Women's magazines, they always have to fact check. So, and because they're done further out. Um, newspapers don't have to, uh, but the better journalists will. Don't trust the headlines though. Headlines are done by completely separate people who are looking for the hook to get you roped in. So. Absolutely. You know, um, the, the core message that I'm taking away from today is um, that you can get, you can get the same amount of calories by eating more of the right kind of foods, right? Um, but I think there are a couple people are asking questions here, and I think that I, I want to get your take on this because I think this relates to the Noom question. Is that um, there, there's a little bit of psychology involved here too, mm -hmm. right? Does yeah. does presentation matter, right? Does a smaller uh -huh. Smaller plates with more food make it appear as if you're mm -hmm. you're eating more um, things of that nature. So Mike and Beth are asking questions about um, the use of smaller plates and how that uh -huh. might be helpful as well. Yeah. So we did a study some years ago. On, um, we had four different plate sizes. We had a buffet. People could take as much or as little as they wanted. We had four different dishes. Um, 
plate size didn't make a difference in how much they ended up eating. If they had the smaller plate, they went back more often for uh, more food. Um, there's a lot of mixed research on plate size. It got a lot of publicity from a, a colleague who really pushed it. If you're using plate size specifically to guide how much food you should take, then it can work. Uh, there are a number of uh, weight loss trials that have used the divided plates that show how many vegetables or a smaller plate, and they can be a benefit. But just counting on plate size to automatically help you eat less, I mean, it's about what you put on that. So, you know, in the end, and one, one thing, we did a survey of um, chefs some years back asking what determined the portions they served and they said plate size so you might find that in restaurants um the chef doesn't want the plate to look too empty unless it's really upscale right. and then the emptier the better but you know um <laughs> if they're using that plate as a guide then you you will be served more food and it's the portion of the food we've done a lot of studies on portion size the bigger the portion you serve the more you're going to eat yeah, we did a we did a study in uh, Cafe Laura uh, here on campus some years back where we um, varied the portion size of a really popular pasta dish they were serving behind the scenes. Even the people working the line didn't know what we were doing. My students were back cooking this up, and um, the bigger the portion of the pasta, the more the people ate of the pasta. And interestingly, the more they ate of the side dishes too, which was really a surprise. We thought because they were eating more pasta that they would eat less of everything else, but they didn't. Um, so yeah, don't count on plate size unless you're specifically using it to, to guide um, how much you're taking. Barbara, last question we have for you. It's a two-part question, actually. If you were going to recommend one of your books, someone wants to buy one of them, which one would you recommend? And uh, if people want more information, where can they go to find more information about your work? Okay, so the first book is um, back from 2000, so it's older. It has a lot of the basic explanation, um, a lot more prose and uh, such. Um, we hired a recipe developer there. I don't like the recipes as much as the next two where uh, we did the recipes ourselves. This, the second one is, is much shorter. It's just really a snapshot of what to do, the eating plan. The ultimate volumetrics diet is a 12-week plan and it has amazing recipes. Um, and it's, it's the most current. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not very good at keeping our book website up to date, but if you give me a nudge and tell me I need to do it, maybe I will. So, <laughs> I mean, the best way to find out what we're doing is to look up on Google Scholar or something like that, because, you know, basically, push come to shove. I am a professor and I teach and I am a Penn Stater. So, you know, and, and so to do all the diet book stuff right. is sort of the, the extra, which maybe if I ever actually retire, might. <laughs> so I, I don't treat people. I'm not a, you know, not the conventional. I just think it's amazing that books written by a professor have done as well as they have and have had such traction. And I'm, I'm really pleased. So there's clear that a lot of people are really wanting the science and that's where we are with it. Well, we will be providing that information uh, to the folks that have signed up for this. They will get links to how they can buy your books. They'll get a link to um, how they can rewatch this session again. But we want to thank you for joining us today on the virtual speaker session. We're lucky to have you here at Penn State. Oh, well, I'm so pleased to to be at Penn State. I love it. And we want to thank everyone else for tuning in today, whether you're on Facebook Live or you're right here in the Zoom room with us. Thank you. Uh, we will be hosting additional speaker sessions in the coming weeks and months. And this programming is in addition to a wide array of online networking and career programs that can be found throughout the year. You can find the full listing on our website at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thanks again for joining us. And as always, we are Penn State. <laughs>